used to us. We have been trying to become like the world instead of becoming like Jesus. We want to look like the world. We want to sound like the world. We want to be loved uh, like the world. Am I right? Have nothing to do with them. It says James 4 4. Maybe that's the verse I was thinking of a while ago. It says this You adulterous people. In other words, you unfaithful ones. Don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Yes, there it is. John 15 19. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. This is why the world hates you. You know, one of the things that, maybe the word isn't glad, but I'm not surprised that the world hates the church. We're seeing that in the United States. We're seeing that in our nation. The world hates the church. They hate it in California. They hate it in Michigan. They hate it in New York. And it won't be long we'll be hating it here. You see it? You think we're living in the last days? John 17, 14, Jesus is praying for his church. He says, I've given them your word, and your, the world has hated them. For they are not of the world, not of the world, any more than I am of the world. Galatians 1, 10. Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? That's what we're getting ready to come down to. That's where many Christians are finding themselves in fusses and quarrels and fights right now because we've got to decide who am I going to obey? Whose approval do I want? Do I want the governor's approval or do I want God's approval? And, and where do I draw that line? That's the question. But let me just tell you this. Over time, that line is going to become more and more distinct. And some of us are going to be hated because of our disobedience of the government. We're going to be persecuted because of our disobedience of the government. Our families, our families and our friends are going to be ashamed of us. Disown us. God help us unfriend us on Facebook. <laughs> Because we're going to obey God rather than men. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, back to our text. It says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Number three, how do we live in the last days? We must learn and teach the word of God clearly. As we live in these days, let me just say that, let me be sure you understand this. People, and listen, a lot of Christians do not know the Word of God. And let me say this to you, Christian. There is no excuse. You, can, you don't even have to own a Bible anymore. Just go online, go on your smartphone, and you can get 40 different translations. So I don't understand that language. It's hard to read. No, it isn't. Not anymore. There is no reason for you not to be able to read and as a child of God, with the help of God's Holy Spirit, be able to understand the Word of God and, and, by the way, did you know the Bible that said, said to many of us, by this time you ought to be teachers? I look around this room, I see a lot of people have been Christians for a long time. You know what the Bible tells me and tells you? The Bible tells me that you all ought to be teachers. What do we need to do in the last days? We need to be teachers of the Word of God. Let me give you three reasons. Number one, we must present God's absolute standard of truth because the truth has been corrupted. Like Pilate said 2,000 years ago, now what is truth? Do you think you're going to get it from Washington? 
God help me, I don't want to offend anybody, but do you think you're going to get it in the public school? Where are people going to hear the truth? On the news? Well, it's on the internet. It must be true. <laughs> How, listen, let's be honest. How many of us have been absolutely duped by stuff on the internet? We'll read something. Oh, this can't be. This can't be true. And, and we'll forward it to all of our friends only to find out it wasn't true. <laughs> the world is starved for the truth. Sometime next, uh, not next month, but in October, sometime in October, there will be a message presented here at Calvary. And that message will feature five principles to vote. I just want to find out, how many of you plan to vote in November? Would you raise your hand? Good. Hope you do. I'm not going to ask you who you're going to vote for. I'm not going to ask you why you're going to vote for who you vote for. But I am going to ask you how are you going to vote? What is going to, what is, what is it that's going to just make your decision for you? Let me tell you what it won't be. It won't be the debates. It won't be the candidates. It might not even be the party platform, and hopefully it's not just because it's your party. But one of the five things you're going to hear is that one of the, one of the principles upon which we uh, base our vote is the truth. The truth. There must be truth. Not a law to be obeyed, but the truth to guide our lives. God's truth is not relative. It does not change from person to person. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, study to show yourselves approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, and rightly dividing the word of truth. So we must be guided by the truth. Somebody asked me one day, if you're a Christian, how can you vote for so-and-so? Have you heard that one? Yeah. My response to them is, I don't vote for so-and-so. I vote for the truth. <coughs> well, how do you know what's the truth? They're all liars. Again, I'm voting on God's truth, not man's truth. Right? Yeah. How do you live in the last days? Well, you live in the last days because people need the truth. The Word of God must be taught early. Those of you that have little ones, the Word of God must be taught early, often, constantly, and consistently. Psalm 119 9 says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. Psalm 119 11 says, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119 105, your, lamp, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. I, write, I wrote in the front of my own Bible, Sin will keep you from this book, or this book will keep you from sin. Stay in the book and let the book stay in you. Amen. I write it in the front of every Bible I have. We must teach the Word of God clearly. Why? Number two, so that we will not tolerate sin in the church. And by that, I also mean we will not tolerate sin in self. What has happened? Some sins we tolerate and some sins we don't. But no sin is to be tolerated in the church or by the church of Jesus Christ. None. And I know what happens. We get to comparing sin and put them in categories. And we talk about this group and that group, but we don't talk about our problems. Sin. 
sexual promiscuity, sexual immorality is one of the greatest sins in the church of Jesus Christ. So next time you want to point your finger at somebody who has a unbiblical sexual lifestyle or an unbiblical traditional marriage and you want to wag your finger at them just remember they're probably lost and they're living the only way they know how but when we give ourselves to someone other than our spouse in any way that is sexual we are sinning before almighty God and we know that and God expects that disobedience disobedience in every area of scripture one of them would be tithing another one would be worship and church attendance and I'll get more to that here in just a moment but we should not tolerate sin within the church. Confess it, yes. Expose it, yes. Forgive it, yes. Ignore it, no. Tolerate it, absolutely not. Did you know that when Jesus talked to the church about the end days, in the book of Revelation, what did he tell the church? Repent. The seven churches of Asia, I believe there's only one church he never, he never said repent. Philadelphia. Philadelphia. The rest of them he said repent. One was to repent of self-dependency and self-wealth and, and all that. Another was to, they left their first love. Another, sin, another one was, was told to repent because they tolerated the intolerable. The work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate, God said. So the question is, folks, are, are we the church needing to repent? The answer is yes. Yes, we need to repent. The Bible says if judgment must begin, let it begin at the house of God. And I believe that Jesus right now is in the midst of judging his church. I, I believe Jesus is purifying his church and getting his church ready for his coming. Read Matthew 25 sometime. That should open your eyes. 1 John 2, 1 through 6. I don't really have time to read all that. Let me just read verse 6. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Number 3. Why is it that we need to learn and teach the word of God clearly in the last days because prophecy is being fulfilled and God's people must be able to recognize it and distinguish between what is false and what is real because we are living during a time of great deception we are living during a time when the deceiver of all deceivers is about to come into power in the world and Christian be sure you're not deceived as a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that we need to recognize the times. Yes, I don't know the day or the hour, but I believe the Bible clearly presents for us the season in which Christ is going to return. Number four, why do we, how do we live or what does it need, mean to live in the last days? Number four, the world is lost needs of the Savior, and time is getting short. Thus far, the world has rejected its God for the natural man. Promiscuity, adultery, perversion, and debauchery, all these things are normal. But God has condemned the world that rejects Him. The cross condemns sin, but offers hope and salvation to the sinner. And we all know John 3, 16, verses, uh, verse 16 through 18. The world needs a Savior. Number five. Our work has just begun. 
The enemy is emboldened. He does not rest and neither should we. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1 it says the spirit clearly says that in latter times some will abandon the faith, abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Oh, I wish I had the time to tell you about something that's going on with somebody I know. There are Christians who identify themselves as Christians who are dabbling in the occult. I know some of them. I know one very well. And he doesn't claim to be a Christian. But it's happening. It's all around us. There is an active Wiccan group in McPherson, Kansas. Make no mistake. Our work has just begun. We must be diligent in sharing our faith, sharing the good news of salvation with anyone and everyone we meet. Because the Bible says in verse 17 of our text that we have been equipped for every good work. I'm running here because I want to get finished. So we move forward. With one eye on the field white to harvest and the other to the eastern sky. What does it mean to live in the last days? It means he is coming. The question is, are we ready to meet him? Are we ready to trust him? Are we, are we ready to tell others about him? And in the last days, come with one last warning. You need to get all the way to number six. There, that's it, I'm sorry. Tomorrow may be too late. That's how quick his coming will be. Hebrews 13, or Hebrews 3, 12 through 15. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Did you know the Bible says in the latter days the hearts of many will grow cold? There will be a great apostasy and a great falling away. If you know someone who's a member of Calvary and they're not in church right now, or they've fallen away, you need to be sure that you're telling them this. Tell them this. The Bible says, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called a day, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. And it's just been said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you once did. Hebrews 10, 25, that verse we preachers like to quote a lot, where it says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but rather encourage one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. He's coming back. Tomorrow may be too late. Jesus said this in Matthew 24, 44. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not. Expecting. Ready or not, he's coming. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Lord, I, there's so much more. I wanted to say so much more I could have said. Lord, I definitely did not want to be misunderstood, and I don't think I was misunderstood in anything that I did say. Lord, I want to just ask you, not that you need to be asked, but Lord, I, I do pray and claim your promise that your word will not return void, but will accomplish that which it is sent forth to do. Oh God, bless your word. Bless your church. Help us to live in that moment of anticipation. Jesus, come quickly. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Amen.
understand. 